Hey, I'm Scott. And I'm Chris. And this is Doxologic, where we help you think with your Bible. Well, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Doxologic. It is a joy to be together, and we have got a special guest today, Scott, don't we? We sure do. Welcome our friend and new pastor at Doxa Church, Isaac. Oh, man, it's so good to be here, guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. man. Good to have you join us. Isaac Van Epps just moved from uh, Akron, Ohio, yep. right? Yep. And we're excited to have uh, folks in our church get to know you. And as we were even just talking before, this is just one introduction. Now, yeah. you'll have a lot, but this might be helpful, I think, just to kind of lay down a little of your background for mm-hmm. our people to understand um, everything from just personal background to yep. ministry background and, and help us. We're going to have a few things to get to because uh, counseling is um, quite a broad topic. Biblical yeah. counseling yeah. covers a whole lot, and we're and excited that's to focus, just... Right? That's your focus, yeah. Biblical Soul Care Pastor. Um, and as I, as I said, uh, joking but not from the stage recently as we introduced you, there's a lot of work to do, man. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a lot in front of us. It's exciting. It yeah, is really exciting. Is. Yeah. So so yeah. maybe just um, let's start here. Where, where do you come from? Where do you hail yeah. from? A little about your family, yeah. some upbringing. Yeah, yeah. So... I was born and raised in Northern Virginia, and uh, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home, and uh, both my parents were independent, fundamental Baptist church folk, and okay. uh, so I learned the gospel very early on and uh, learned my need for salvation, and uh, the Lord drew me to Himself, and it was pretty pretty awesome to uh, grow up in a Christian home. Uh, my wife and I have been married for 15 years. And, uh, so 2007? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And okay. Uh, nice. we, we actually met uh, in high school. Yeah, high school sweethearts. Awesome. And so uh, I wooed her with my Jeep. That's what I like to oh, say. Oh, is that so, right? So, what yeah. color was the Jeep? It was a blue Jeep. Blue, blue Jeep, Jeep Wrangler, doors okay. and top off. There so, you go. Yeah. That's the way to do yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, girl, <laughs> come on in. <laughs> my blue Jeep. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, so we're, yeah, we uh, we met in high school, went to prom together, and uh, just fell in love, and yeah, it's been, it's been great. Yeah, yeah it's been awesome. a good journey. So we uh, both went to Liberty University and uh, both studied ministry there for undergrads, and then uh, went overseas to the other side of the world to serve um, as missionaries in Nepal and India. Mm. Uh, There we oversaw an orphanage and uh, also did some, I did some indigenous pastoral training with our sending church, uh, working with local pastors there. It was really, really exciting work. Same cities? uh, Or like surrounding areas? Surrounding areas. Nepal? Yeah, Nepal. And... And uh, West Bengal, which West is Bengal, north, okay. northeastern, uh, okay. north, uh, yeah, eastern uh, India. Okay, great. Yeah. So that was your first few years of marriage. Oh yeah, yeah. So Just it was right into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk about running right into the fryer. Yeah, it really was. Uh, I mean, we had a house full of kids. Um, not many of them. Not your own kids. Spoke not yet. Our language. Yeah, not our own kids. And uh, so, yeah, a huge learning curve, but God was so gracious to us. We learned so much through that experience of just leaning into mm-hmm. the dependency, uh, being absolutely dependent upon the Lord. Mm-hmm. And uh, He was so, so faithful. One of the ways in which He was absolutely faithful is I was able to learn Nepalese. Uh, I was fluent in it. I could read, Seriously? write, wow. and speak it. Wow. Um, and I failed Spanish in <laughs> okay. high school. So that was a work of God. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no so, no that so. is a work of God. Because yeah. that is not a comparably like no. a similar language in terms of difficulty. No. We are talking major step up from Spanish. There is nothing paralleled <laughs> at all. Like okay. <laughs> Sanskrit. So cool. Yeah. And all the glory goes to him. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I. I can't remember it now, so sure. don't don't ma- match me up with your Nepalese friend and think that I'm going to be able to carry <laughs> oh, on. Oh, come meet Isaac! <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, not so he much. It fluently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so from those missionary years, uh, then the family grew. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So now mm-hmm. your your kiddos. Tell us about yeah. them. Yeah. So we have two boys now. Uh, our oldest is Elijah, and he is 11 years old. And Samuel, uh, he's five. And uh, yeah, we came back from the mission field um, and uh, 
really wanted to go right back. Uh, we came back for a furlough, but there was a lot of visa things that happened and just really, it was difficult to get back. And the Lord was just really clearly closing that door, mm. that chapter. And uh, I went back to seminary, I went pursuing my MDiv. And uh, while I was going through s- school, I was like, I really feel this call to go to this next mission field, mm. whatever this might be. Okay. And the Lord called us into uh, me into a military chaplaincy. Uh, so I had the privilege of serving as an Army uh, Reserve chaplain for over seven years. Nice. Um, and uh, I was, when I, while I was pursuing my MDiv and uh, even afterwards, uh, and it was a great, fulfilling experience, uh, you know, doing chaplaincy uh, within the military and also... Also within uh, hospital chaplaincy and jail chaplaincy, I wanted to try it all. Yeah, you you got and around. I got around. Uh, I did. I wow. did. That's yeah, cool. yeah. And one of the things that I love so much about chaplaincy is that you get to go into an area, uh, a season of people's lives that is just so difficult. Sure, it's a hard season that they're going through, uh, whether it's you know in the military, traumatic experiences through combat, um, you know, jail, uh, a hospital. And uh, there's something special and powerful to be able to go in and minister in an environment like that. Mm. I really feel like the Lord uh, uses those experiences kind of like till up the soil. And a lot of these questions that are deep soul questions that are there kind of come to the surface. Mm. And uh, I learned a lot through this experience of what not to do. (laughs) Sure. Sure. (laughs) And and, uh, so, yeah. Some of the best lessons are that, right? Yeah. What not to do. Right. Uh Uh-huh. Learned in difficult uh, examples that come to mind, I'm sure. Yeah. Times where you're like, oh, okay. Shouldn't have done that. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't But helpful. hey, you'll never do it again. <laughs> right. So there are, those are helpful lessons, you know, and, and when you think about being in ministry and you make a decision to get an MDiv, I'm just curious, what was your thought process behind that? Was it, g- give me your sense, lack of training and you're like, hey, I, I just want to continue to do ministry and feel like I need this training. Yeah. yeah. What was your intention behind getting your MDiv in the first place? Yeah, I think I think it, I I knew knew from my time overseas in Nepal and India that I needed more training. I needed more experience. I wanted to go a little deeper into into the word, into the theology, church history, and things like that. And I knew that an MDiv would give me that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also just um, a lot of my mentors said, "This is really your next step." And so I just trusted them and leaned into that. So yeah, I'm thankful for that. Time. That's good. Yeah, I went to Liberty as well for my for my uh, seminary degree. And the Lord really still, provided, right? You guys still hired me, even though I went to Liberty. <laughs> so it's a Liberty, so. <laughs> right. I'm not a master. Didn't guy. hold it against him. <laughs> we, that's right. That's right. Which is funny because we actually have quite the array yeah. of different graduate school backgrounds on staff. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I'm, you know, two Western guys. Two Western guys. Liberty. Mm-hmm. You got Jessup with Jessup. Zach, master's mm. with me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit of a... Um, We're not just a one-trick pony over that's here. Right. That's right. Good to know. That's uh, right. Backgrounds we accept. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I felt like even as I was getting to know you, like getting to, getting to see the resume that you first sent with your experience and your education, I was like, boy, there's a lot that I don't know because mm. of that background that I mm-hmm. wanted to get to know about you personally. I feel like that it's a little bit w- with me. Mm. Uh, my undergrad from Point Loma, which is like a Wesleyan Nazarene school, and then mm. Western Seminary, uh, that doesn't answer a lot of questions you'd yeah. like. I feel like you know, Scott. In general, guy went to masters probably answers a number of questions just by <laughs> for good, or better for worse. Hopefully for good and <laughs> maybe, but it probably tells you a lot about the type of education. But then you think about I know the journey I've gone on since my uh, undergrad days mm. into being more reformed was quite the the yeah. formation was yeah. in that MDiv process to mm. really understand the unfolding plan of God, His yeah. sovereignty, the the what I would argue is the best way of mm-hmm. seeing God's redemptive plan through his mm-hmm. sovereignty in, in Reformed theology through Western, which is not purely a, a Reformed school, but they do have an array, and I, anyways, came to appreciate that greatly. So um, I, I know that's some of your journey, too. Like, how, Would you say it was your MDiv time? Would you say it was after that, mm-hmm. where like Reformed theology um, really took root for you? Yeah, I think it would have to. Uh, this is a good transition point, actually. This question, because you know, it was through my time in chaplaincy okay. that I was really wrestling with a lot of these things. Like, wow, this is really. There's some really hard things that people are going through, and I know that there's a good God, yet He's all powerful and sovereign. Like, how does this all? How does this all fit together? Mm. And um, I saw a number of my. 
uh, fellow students just really struggling uh, with their theology. Uh, they came from all different denominations and even uh, backgrounds, and it just, I could see many of them actually going away from ministry mm. because of the difficult things that they experienced and mm. see, saw. Mm. And at, yeah. it was during that time that I just clung to God's word and just said, Lord, you have to have answers here. Mm. And uh, it was through that time where I found really, really great help in a lot of the Reformed tradition, um, just trying to wrap my head around uh, yeah. God's goodness and yet his sovereignty as well. And uh, it, was a, it was like a, a lamp on my feet, literally, as I myself was struggling with how, how what's going on? I don't understand this. Sure. And it definitely helped me to uh, to bridge the gap. So that's awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. It's really good to good to hear. You moved from chaplaincy into full time pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. um, what was that transition like? You know, yeah. per, what precipitated that? Not everyone yeah. goes from chaplaincy. That can be a career in and of itself, sure. right? Either in the military or various forms of chaplaincy organizations. So, what precipitated you moving into the the kind of local church work? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there was a number of times in which, when I was in the military or in the hospitals, that I just really felt this conviction that I was not able to practice according to my full convictions, meaning I couldn't be true to myself. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was walking this tightrope of political correctness constantly. Mm -hmm. and So they were basically dictating how you could minister or what even theological boundaries you had within which to minister as a chaplain. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was more of the how to minister, okay. um, of what you could and could not say or do. Got it. Um, and it just became really, really, really restricting. Hmm. Uh, there was this one moment where I was uh, um, serving as a chaplain at, down at Fort Lewis, Washington, and uh, there's an as a as a chaplain, as a Christian chaplain, you are to provide religious accommodations and and counseling and support for any of the men or women in your unit. And so there's a number of Muslim soldiers within our in our unit, and it was during Ramadan, and uh, so we had to I had to write up a number of religious accommodations and things like that. And I was going out uh, to pick them up to come back to the chapel uh, tent, and before I went out um, uh, to get them to bring them back to the chapel tent, uh, I had to transform the chapel into a mosque essentially. Mm. So I'm. I remember this moment where I'm walking up to the altar and I'm taking the cross off of its place and I'm putting a Quran there. And I'm picking up the chairs and I'm putting prayer rugs down. And the Holy Spirit just gut checked me and mm -hmm. he was like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And at that point, I knew that my time was limited if I were to walk in obedience to the Lord. Mm. Um, I know that there are many, and there might be some chaplains right now listening to this right now, and they're like, you just need to get over that and such and such. And I, I just personally, I couldn't. And so I, I uh, appealed uh, to get a uh, religious accommodation to, to get removed from the service earlier, because uh, usually there's an eight-year mandatory service obligation. And I, I actually got out of the military before that because of this uh, religious um, you know, conviction that I had that I could yeah. no longer serve. And so I wanted to get into a church where I could actually just preach the gospel and share fully the full truth. Um, and uh, I, I got ambitious and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go plan a church. <laughs> And then I, I'm just going to go do it. Can it yeah, yeah. How, how, how <laughs> hard can it be, Scott? <laughs> Get a website, yeah, you yeah. know, well, see if there's a building available. <laughs> oh, man. If you so, build it, they will come. Right, that, right. That's not how it knows. Oh, yeah, so. Kevin Costner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not the Bible. That's Costner, my, Kevin Costner. My bad, my bad. Oh. I get my movie quotes and my Bible verses mixed up. That's great. I'm sorry. Oh, man. So, yeah, I went to a church planning conference, and I was like, oh, man. Uh, I need to go into a church as an associate, one pastor, to yeah. learn a lot. And yeah. so the last uh, almost seven years, I've been at a chap at a church, uh, the Chapel of Akron, and I served as a pastor of care mm -hmm. and counseling there. And it was just so amazing to finally get to a place where I could actually equip people 
to do caring and counseling ministry in the church. And it just was absolutely mind blowing to see the ministry just expand yeah. and just be a part of the heartbeat of the church. Um, so, um, those I'm excited to do it again. So yeah. I'm out here and I'm kind of, I don't know, I guess I, I'm kind of like a church planter at heart, I guess you might say. So I'm kind of like, I did it there. I've, uh, I've worked myself out of a job. I mean, we have a robust care and counseling ministry at the church I was yeah. at, and now I feel like I'm free to go and do it all over again. Mm. And uh, I'm excited to what the Lord will do. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is Great. not at all my work. Yeah, I want to give all the glory to God. I mean, He definitely um, has built this up, and uh, I know that He's going to do it here in Doxa. So praise God! What an interesting dynamic. The counseling pieces Mm -hmm. with what I'm getting is that kind of lowercase a apostolic piece of you, Mm. right? The kind of sent piece. We're not talking capital A, we're talking lowercase. Sure. But the idea of like, to, to get up and do it all over again. Mm. And and we, we could talk a little bit about this, Chris, just the the, the difficulty of finding the right guy. Mm, sure. Because most people with the background that you have and the experience of being a biblical counseling pastor are typically, and with the degree of MABC, Masters of Arts in Biblical Counseling, they typically want to do just the counseling. Mm. And we were looking for a guy to raise up a slew of an army of counselors yeah. right. Right. doing that Ephesians 4 dynamic yeah. piece alongside the biblical counseling. Sure. And that took the field from who big to a very narrow lane. And it was like difficult to, and do you want to well, yeah, there? To, to put it in a simple word, we needed a builder. Right? Yes. Someone who's and hard to find it, right? Yeah. Hard to find it because to your point, uh, if you get trained up in, in uh, biblical counseling, you uh, want, man, you want to get in the room because you see so much fruit in it and you yeah, want to yeah. be on the front lines yeah. and, uh, you know, maybe take, take every case. And if I'm going to work 40 hours, I want 35 of them in the room and right. the other five thinking about them. Yeah. yeah it's an exaggeration. Yeah, I get right? what you're saying. Nonetheless, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, thinking about getting ready and no, we need someone who is a trainer, a teacher of others to build it, multiply yourself and just yes. knowing that you um, got the opportunity to do that, that God uh, uh, saw just in his you know, will and kindness to give you great fruit mm-hmm. in that, and uh, even talking to uh, just a, a couple of the people who love you dearly, who have been under your counseling care and then became counselors as well, and the, the care that continues, right? Because mm-hmm. a, a, pastor, a, a pastor over biblical counseling um, is also needing to lead and be a shepherd to mm-hmm. the servants in the ministry. Because it can be an isolating experience to be doing counseling, right? And so the pastoral care is also to those doing the work. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. I think uh, I got tired within chaplaincy of being the lone wolf, Mm. being the only person. Yeah. You know, and when crisis hit or whatever was going on, they came directly to me. And I was like, you know what? I'm called as a pastor, I'm ordained. I'm called to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, to build up the body so it grows up and matures. And that has been my heartbeat. That is like everything that I do. And I cannot get any more joy than to see uh, people who come in as counselees yeah. and actually exit or go on from that place as counselors. Yeah. And so I have great confidence that the, the Spirit of God, the Word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ can is sufficient mm, to sure. take people's story, their hardship, their difficulty, and redeem it, mm. and and use it in a mighty way in people's lives. Um, and I've seen it happen over and over again. So uh, it gets me so excited. Yeah, I I, no, I, I, I can tell. <laughs> I, I see it. I hear it. I have heard it. I, we, you know, is four four months ago almost that we first got introduced, and, yeah. and quite a long process, and, and here you are. So it's yeah. just incredible. Um, I want to turn to what I really appreciated in our time um, back in uh, after Thanksgiving, getting to know your just a framework, and and maybe even where you um, uh, got it from. I believe this is inherited what oh, we're yeah. about to go over, yeah. but kind of where that it comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, the th- kind of three E's as it mm-hmm. relates to wh- how you understand the human condition. Yeah. Um, and as it relates to your counseling, and this can just be a broad overview, but I think it's it's very memorable, mm-hmm. and it can be helpful to Christians to really understand, um, yeah, wh- who I am, how that impacts uh, the way I live and grow as a believer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anything profound that I have has been stolen from somewhere. 
So, uh, amen. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, I don't know if anyone's. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, from the Bible, first yeah, and foremost. Hopefully from the Bible. <laughs> if I've got great. totally original thoughts, we are all in trouble, right. right? From the Bible. But nonetheless, good teachers yeah. can synthesize and yeah. just, um, yeah. they're so helpful. In such and, a memorable way yeah. that it becomes part of your own thought process, yeah. right? You just, right. You, it, it's immersed in your own ministry mm-hmm. and life. Yeah. And, uh, and I love that about, thank God for church history. Amen. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Yeah, so the three E's, uh, I see them uh, seeing a person. Uh, each individual person is really, the first E is understanding them, that they're an embodied soul. They're an embodied soul. So as you look at a person, oftentimes you just look at the physiological piece of them. Okay, this is who they are. This is, you know, they're this ethnicity, they're this background. This is their life-shaping events in their life. Uh, this, their mind, you know, um, uh, oftentimes, even in today, in today's society, we look at people, and um, especially here, in, um, as I'm beginning to learn about California, like uh, DSM categories, like it's just the way that people identify themselves. The vocabulary. Right. Yeah. 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 So, like, everybody show. has some sort of diagnosis. Or, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm a, a, elaborating a bit, but I mean, you know, even youths and high school students, I mean, they just feel like that's where their identity is in some sort of physiological, life shaping event or their mind mm-hmm. of like a, um, a diagnosis of some sort. Yeah. Um, and that's really, uh, you know, within clinical counseling, that's where they really focus in on. Um, it's really of the, the mind and the body. I mean, they, uh, clinical counseling has robust science of looking at behavioral sciences and looking at a person and saying, hey, this is what's going on physiologically within a person's mind, within their body. This is when a person is anxious or having an anxiety attack. This is what's happening physiologically. And this, these are helpful coping tools to slow down or quiet the the body and the mind of a person but what i'm really excited about is the soul because we're we're not just a body we're a soul and uh and to be able to bring uh truth to the inner person the true person that's there um that's that's the exciting part and so the inner person the body soul we're embodied in a soul um, our, our souls are embodied. Um, that that soul piece is it. It is specifically oriented around how we were created. We were created as worshipers, and so there's like this deep DNA within all of us that we're worshiping something all the time. And there's these deep um, questions that we have of like, who are we? Mm-hmm. You know, why are we created? What's the purpose of this? Uh, why does it have to hurt? You know, those are the kind of things that uh, um, people need sec- answers to. Secular right? psychology just yeah. doesn't really have an answer to sure. that. And uh, so biblical counseling really does dive deep right into those questions and help them explore the gospel and the word of God to bring mm-hmm. truth to light to those areas. So that's the first E. The second one, so we're embodied souls. The second one, we're, in, we're embedded souls. So... Uh, what we see throughout scripture is that we're not just, uh, we are embedded into a world that is broken. And, and this world is broken due to sin. It's fallen physically, um, spiritually. Um, and so you're constantly in this world where, um, just things aren't right, you know? Um, so there's disasters, there's all these hardships and there's these questions of the soul that comes, come out in the midst of all that. And also, you know, we're, we're also embedded souls, and we ex- experience suffering right. from others. You know, other people, because we're in this broken, sinful world, there's broken, sinful people that are sinning against us, and we're sinning against them because we're broken, sinful right. people. And so that's another framework as well. And then the third E is embattled. We're embattled souls. Um, so um, often, oftentimes we don't think of that. Um, but there's really a spiritual warfare all around us. You know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against its, you know, principalities and rulers of the darkness. And so there really is a spiritual realm that's all around us. And we really need to acknowledge that, uh, not give more 
validity to it, like we're casting out demons of alcoholism and those kind of things. But, uh, but really seeing that there's, there's really a, a warfare that's going on around us, and we need to uh, realize that and, uh, and yield to the Lord, run to the Lord in the midst of that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And just, you know, because uh, we believe in the Word of God being what it is, mm-hmm. biblical counseling has a unique not only lens, but but power and, and ability to get into those very places yeah. of the soul, right? So it's the embedded soul that deals with suffering, mm-hmm. and it's not just, um, and this is a, a loose example, but well, um, sh- she's been through a lot. Mm-hmm. She's, you know, feeling sad and depressed straight to the, straight to the medication. This is not a pronouncement mm-hmm. about whether or not there's ever a spot for that, mm-hmm. but it's to say, wait a minute, the suffering... Uh, from the loss of someone, from the treatment she's received at the hands of others in sin, mm. that needs a soul help. Yeah, that's where the Word of God comes in with because it is the truth of God. Mm. It uniquely positions us as counselors in the Word to yeah. be able to minister to that person, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to like sometimes it gets this wrong reputation of being harsh and it's always like straight to the sin problem. And there's a reality of that, mm-hmm. unfortunately at times, and that needs to be corrected, but it also is the compassion of God's word yeah. to come along the sufferer. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, there's only so deep that the clinical methods can actually penetrate. I mean, there's a, there is like with depression and things like that, it's, they promise the world clinical counseling, yeah. promise the world. You take a pill, you do this, you do that, and they under-deliver. This will make it go away. Yeah. Yeah. And so what we're seeing over and over again is that there's people who are uh, who are beginning to see the reality mm. that these things just don't uh, meet those soul issues that are there, and we need to go deeper than that. And I think that's where the gospel, obviously, is the and the Word of God is sufficient mm. to meet these needs as well. So... Yeah. And probably just even thinking about these E's, um, what it does to give someone this framework Mm -hmm. and to open the Word of God with them, and for someone to triumph over a particular life-dominating sin Mm -hmm. with the uh, power of the Holy Spirit and obedience to the Word. I mean, it it has to be such a joy to to see this unfold. And of course, I I could speak from my own experience, but I want to hear yours of of like just what is that like when someone is set free like that? Give us a sense of your just heart for that as a pastor. Oh my goodness. There's nothing better ever than to be there right in front of a person when they finally, when the spirit of God kind of like takes the, the scales off their eyes and they begin to see the beauty of the gospel penetrating to that specific area of hurt, suffering or sin. And uh, it, it is exhilarating to see them just light up mm. and the joy and the peace that comes from, uh, from a relationship with Christ. Yeah. Um, and so the way I, awesome. the way I wrap my head around it, it's like right thinking, like we just talked about, like this, these three E's here embodied, embedded and battled beginning to look at an area of suffering or trial in that right mindset and that theologically correcting your theology, you might say, Will re, re relate will uh, result in right relating to God, hmm. and that's what you get to see there yeah. in this moment. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. You know, when you're, uh, I, I, I'm not a big like preacher guy. Uh, I like, I, I teach, I preach, but it's not like my love. My love is to be there in the room with one other person and be able to take the word of God, hear their story. And then to be able to see them have that light moment, that aha moment, and and they're relating to God in that mm. moment. You can actually see it. Yeah, uh, it's it's a powerful thing. And so, right thinking leads to right relating, and then that results in right living. Mm-hmm. And so, oftentimes we get that backward. Mm. Like we have to like, hey, you just need to live this way. You mm-hmm. just need to do this. Stop that and do this. Mm-hmm. But really, what we're what we're trying to do is bring them back to the gospel because gospel itself woos a person to relate to God. And there's this powerful moment where you're actually um, communing with your maker and you're truly being fulfilled. That worship void in your life that you've been trying to fill through so many different things Mm. is fully satisfied and filled. And, and then that 
his kindness towards us, right? We understand that leads towards repentance mm. or life change. So it's really, um, it's not a um, imperative uh, commands first and foremost. It's really an indicative uh, first, and that's a big word. Just ref- referring to God doing the work first and foremost. I mean, it's not me or any of the the counselors that are doing this work. It is God initiated, and that's mm. what I love so much about Reformed tradition is that. Uh, we believe full heartedly that God initiates this work of salvation. He's the one who completes it. So really when uh, it takes the pressure off of me and any of our counselors, it's like, God, you're going to do this. You, you have to do this. Yeah. It, we are absolutely dependent upon you mm. to open up their eyes and help them to have that right thinking, right relating, right. And, then, uh, and then right living. Right. So. So that is a classic um, biblical counseling, um, well, philosophy, I guess, of the indicatives, the yeah. truth statements, the truths of the gospel, mm-hmm. God's character, who I am, you mm-hmm. know, those three E's you just went through, right? The indicatives, and then the imperatives or the commands that lead to right living. I yeah. think about the book of Ephesians. Yeah. You got, the fir- like with other letters, too, the first three chapters, just explosive doctrinal. gospel truth, right. doctrinal. Mm-hmm. All I mean, it's just it just covers it all. It's so phenomenal. And then verse... Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, Mm -hmm. a prisoner of the Lord, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And he goes on, and he gets on to put off and put on, and there's many commands, but they're after chapters 1 through 3. When you parachute into the commands Mm -hmm. without the right understanding of the identity markers, Mm -hmm. the indicative truths of the gospel, yeah, we we will get upside down quickly, and we will get Mm command-driven, sometimes legalistic, religious in that sense of not Mm -hmm. relating to God and relating relationship with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I profound. love that. It's yeah. done and then it's due. Mm. Right? It's Amen. done and then it's due. It's it's Romans one to eleven and Romans twelve to sixteen. It's Galatians yes. one to four and then Galatians yeah, five, five and, to yeah. six. Right. It's a it, it, there's that dynamic in 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 the the New Testament so prominently. And right? that should be a paradigm for us to counsel Absolutely. right uh, after the word of God. Let me ask you a few questions mm-hmm. and we'll, we'll land the plane just a little bit here, but this is a great conversation. So um biblical counseling done in the local church. Um the idea of of preferring to have a strong biblical counseling ministry in our church that takes care for to, for now at Doxa, right? For us, for now, it's really going to be our people because there's there's a lot of people and a lot of needs. But why should it not be that that pastors just farm it out at least automatically? This isn't a referendum on the whole idea of any professionalization, but why should we prefer to bring people up mm. to be counselors and to try to seek to help them in inside of the church? I don't mean the walls of the church. I mean the people of mm-hmm. of God. Like, why would you say that drives us or you in particular? Yeah, I mean, we're called to be shepherds. Yeah. Uh, a shepherd is one who comes alongside it and knows his sheep. Um, and that is a, that's a high calling. There's a lot within Scripture uh, that, that demands that from us as stewards, um, as shepherds, as overseers of the souls of our people. And, um, and that's... That's really the heartbeat of what biblical counseling is and bringing into the church. So if, if we understand people as broken and coming from hard, hardship and background, none of these things should surprise us that when we hear them, like these sin struggles and things, really, uh, <laughs> if you've been around in pastoral ministry for any period of time, it's just like, yeah, I've, I've seen that. That doesn't shock me. Mm. I, I've seen that. I hear that. Um, and really, what do you do? after that point, you know, um, so somebody has, you know, PTSD or, uh, extreme depression, anxiety, or things like that. Well, if you, if you're a shepherd and you know your sheep and, and you know that that person is struggling in this specific area, well, really, uh, if we do believe the scriptures and the scriptures say that God has given us all things, the scriptures have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, well then, well then where is it? I mean, how are you going to minister specifically to that individual um, in, in their struggle? And, uh, and so what I think is that uh, biblical counseling, um, soul care, is really the heartbeat of what discipleship, true, intimate, interpersonal discipleship looks like within the context of the church. So rather than uh, just saying, okay, 
this person's struggling with depression, we're going to go ahead and, oh, I know a very great, uh, and this is nothing against uh, clinical psychology, but I know a great psychiatrist, you know, here in this area, and I want to send you off to them and, and, and you, know, um, you know, they'll get you on a treatment plan and you'll take the right medication. Um, but why don't, we, why don't we partner with that? Or be able to go into those areas as well and talk deeply about this thing. Anxiety, the scriptures have a lot to say about that. Mm-hmm. Fear, the scriptures have a lot to say about that. Depression, the scriptures have a lot to say about that. And, and I think that if a church is silent to these areas, well then, do we really believe that yeah, God's Word has given us word. <laughs> all yeah. things that we need for life and godliness? And, um, and the reality is that the scriptures don't actually have a DSM index here. You it know. turns out. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. have a DSM index. It does have its own language. It does. That we would be wise to get to know, right? Uh, because it's a robust language. And right? we assume a lot of language that we use yeah. that's uh, I- I- imbibed by osmosis, and we'll use language that <laughs> is not biblical language. Right. Yeah. And that's built into it as well. Can yeah. Give away a lot sometimes mm-hmm. if we get away from the biblical the language and categories of, yeah. of where things belong. Right. You know? I so, love you know. the idea too of it just how we how you're seeing it as like um, so connected to this is discipleship. Yeah. This is just intensive discipleship, mm-hmm. you know. And we've kind of talked about it where a, a good healthy church has both an army and a hospital. Mm-hmm. So there's, because we're, because we're mission-minded, we're an army going forward. We were looking on by mission, God's grace to yeah. take ground on mission for the Lord. But in the midst of that battle, people are going to be picked off in some different ways, right? Uh, uh, hit by affliction of various kinds. And so there needs to be a place to help mm. them, to come alongside them, to see them be rehabilitated and then get back on the field. That's a great image. And so yeah. biblical mm-hmm. counseling really provides that yeah. for the church and the healthy church has both of those things. So the goal is not to just hang out in the hospital forever. No. The goal is to actually get back on the on the field. We are living on a battleground, and we are moving forward, mm-hmm. um, believing that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. That's so good. That's so good. Yeah, that's a good image. It really is. You know, the reality is, is that, you know, we, we really need to uh, provide more than just a referral to our, our sheep in the church. Just say, go so-and-so, take this, you know, those sort of things. But really, the beauty of the gospel is that we come around, we create community, uh, we know, and we love one another. And uh, that's what I absolutely love about, as I look back upon my years in counseling ministry, I mean, the wins that I've seen is really, okay, this person struggles with this area. We've been able to know their story really well speak the gospel into their into those areas and they see such healing and hope but then more than that is that we strategically work with the community that they're embedded in and we have people that come along and know how to wisely care for that person mm. and <laughs> there's nothing better than that i mean that's what the world yearns for you know outside the church they're learn yearning for people who actually know them and love them and care for them, and there's real community where they can be who they are, but not just stay there, as you said, but be on mission mm-hmm. to go, to get better and to go on. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been able to see that over and over again. It's, it's really awesome. It's awesome. That's great. Well, uh, time has flown, man, oh, and yeah. I really appreciate just the opportunity, um, not only that you're here, but to jump on this and to just let people kind of get on the inside picture of, uh, you know, your background, your, your ministry background, but your heart, mm-hmm. you know, the heart for God's church and um, seeing it um, uh, under discipleship, right? As you've already said, this is ultimately a, uh, a paradigm within discipleship, yeah. that biblical counseling comes in and um, sees people. Christians, well, first of all, these people get saved. Yeah. Biblical counseling. Oh, yeah. Because it's so gospel centered and saturated. Mm-hmm. It's going to see people get saved that Praise can't God. come in thinking they're Christians. Yep. It's happened a number of times, even here, and I know in your ministry as well. Um, and, and then to grow and to flourish. And we are so excited about what the Lord is doing um, just in our biblical counseling ministry and to see it continue to grow, man. Uh, so we're grateful. Oh, well, I am just blown away to be here um, and to be with you guys on. On this podcast, I've been watching it and learning from you guys and observing you guys for quite some time, and now I'm a part of the team, the part of the Doxa yeah. family, which is just an amazing experience. I'm really thankful to be part. Yeah. Oh, we're honored to have you. 
Yeah, yeah no doubt. Well, uh, listeners, thank you uh, for um, another episode with us. Hope it's encouraging for you. If this is something uh, that you were getting a lot from, I would encourage you to consider uh, leaving a review, uh, you know, a five-star review, of course. Right, Isaac? I'm sure yeah. Isaac's already done that. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go find his I'm detailed right review. I know. Before he was here, he was loving it. No, uh, but to, uh, we'd appreciate that, sharing that. Uh, I love hearing the stories of how God's even using this, and I hope this is going to encourage your own heart as you continue to grow in your discipleship. So, until next time. You've been listening to Doxologic, a podcast by Doxa Church in Rockland, California. To learn more, visit doxachurch.net.